Hello and welcome to lecture number six, in which we explore continuous distributions with Spotify data. We find out about the central limit theorem and some related statistical tests. And we also become n-dimensional whale sharks. I need to start off this lecture with a bit of a disclaimer, because as I wrote this lecture, the scope gradually increased, because there was always the next thing I wanted to include. And it was kind of hard to stop. The exercise today will be very unrestrictive, so that you can explore in your own tempo, and so that we have more time for questions on Friday. Today we will be exploring the process of modeling and looking at different types of models. In part, we will do so using the Tidy Models framework. The Tidy Models framework extends the Tidyverse with specialized tools for all kinds of modeling tasks, that fit in neatly with all the tools you already know. You can go ahead and install them using install packages and then by the models. I'm not going to run this because I have already installed tidy models. At this point you have installed quite a lot of packages as instructed by me. On one hand this is quite fun because the extent of what we can do and we can also make tedious tasks fun. On the other hand, every package that we add introduces what is called a dependency. So if a user doesn't have the package installed, our analysis won't run for them. If we are feeling experimental and use functions from packages that are under active development and might change in the future, we will run into trouble when we update the package. But never updating anything ever again is no fun. I will show you how to get the best of both worlds all the packages and functions that your hearts desire, while maintaining complete reproducibility. This is to make sure that you can come back to your old projects two years from now and it still just runs as it did at that time. The solution for this is a package called RENV or RENV. The idea is as follows. Instead of installing all your packages into one place, where you can only have one version of a package at a time, RENV installs packages locally in your project folder. It, is, it also meticulously writes down the version numbers of all the packages you installed and keeps a cache so it will not copy the same version twice. It's just a regular R package like any other, so we can install it using install packages RENV. Again, I'm not going to run this because I have already installed. Uh, then, in our studio project in the R console, we run renv colon colon init or initialize. Well, if I run this, it will tell me that I have already initialized it, so um, it will ask me what it should do. And instead, I'm just going to abort this part because uh, I have already done this. What you will want to do is just um, use yes and initialize it. What renv will do is it creates a file called .r file and puts the line source renv activate r. R profile is a special file that automatically runs every time you start an R session in this folder. So it makes sure renv is active anytime you run anything in your folder. It also creates a folder called renv and this is where it will install the packages to locally. The most important file here is the renv.log file. If you have a look at it, it is just a plain text file with all the packages and even the exact R version. And also where this package was in from, installed from. If you have initialized renv for the first time here, you will notice that you still have no packages installed. So if you go ahead and try the trusted library tidyverse, now it will not work for you at first. This is because while well, renv starts out empty, so anytime we want to use something with our project, we need to install it first. We can even uh, we can either do this using the regular install packages or renv's very own, let's do this in the console, there's no place for it in the script actually, <laughs> let's re re remove these. So we will do so in the console using renv install. 
And now we can, for example, rent install with Tidyverse. And I was just about to get a sip of water, but this was really fast because the Tidyverse was already installed globally, so I just had to copy the cache it already had. So it might be really fast. If it has to install something new, it will take a longer time. Uh, then, if we are happy with installing all the things, so we have installed the Tidyverse, we have uh, also installed the Tidy models, and all the other things we will later need, we just have to renv install. Then we run renv snapshot. And what renv snapshot does is it writes down what we installed locally into this renv log file. It will ask for confirmation and I say, yep, yeah, I want to recall these new packages that I installed in the log file and it wrote it down. And now if we come back later to this package or someone else um, gets this, um, this project, so we send it to them, to them and make sure it contains the log file, they just have to run renv restore and it will restore all the packages from the log file and make sure everything is installed just the way we intended to. This uh, renv install function is a bit more powerful than the normal install.packages because it can install packages from different sources. Let's look at two of the main sources that you might be installing packages from. Well, firstly, there is what is called the Comprehensive R Archives Network, or in short, RAN. This is the main place from which you install packages. Our packages on there are subject to certain standards and are usually very stable and tech. This is the normal place install packages installs packages from. We can also install packages directly from the source of other people's code. GitHub is a platform where people can upload code and track changes to it. So it's a bit like the word feature track, track changes, except specialized for code. A lot of times you can find the current development version of an R package or packages that are not yet on CRAN on GitHub. For example, this is the per package here, and it tells us if we want to install the development version, we can install it from GitHub using dev tools. However, if we have RENV, we don't necessarily need dev tools. DevTools can also work with this, this syntax. So this will install the package version that is not yet on CRAN. We want to test out some features for it. And some, some other packages might never make it to CRAN because they are really, really tiny or very specialized. So they're just on GitHub. And you just make, need to make sure you trust the, the people that you install packages from. All models are wrong but some are useful. Such goes the quote by statistician George Box. What this means is that any model is but a simplification of reality and must always omit details. No model can depict the complete underlying reality. However, models are useful, and to understand what they are useful for, we must first look at the different types of models out there. The Tidy Models book which I will link to in the script and I really recommend it. We, we will be using parts of tidy models. Well, this book names three types of models, where any particular model can fall into multiple categories at once. A descriptive model is purely used to describe the underlying data and to make patterns easier to see. To see. When we add a smoothing line to a ggplot with geom smooths, the default method is the so-called LOAS curve, which stands for Locally Estimated Scatterplot Smoothing. It does produce insights by revealing patterns to us, but by itself cannot be used to make, for example, predictions about the future. It is just a pretty looking smoothing line. Next up are inferential models. They are designed to test hypotheses and to make or to make decisions. They rely they rely heavily on our assumptions about the data, for example, what probability distribution the populations follow. And those will be most likely encountered by you to answer research questions. 
They are the models that typically produce p values, which you can which you can compare to a threshold like we did last week. Uh, lastly, predictive models are designed to process the data we have and make predictions about some response variable upon receiving new data. When done correctly, we also hold out on some of the data that are not that our model never gets to see until it is time to evaluate and test how it performs on unseen data. Depending on how much we know or want to know about the underlying processes, we differentiate between mechanistic models, like fitting a physically meaningful function to data, and empirically driven models, which are mainly concerned with creating good predictions, no matter the underlying mechanism. We will now explore different examples but first, let me introduce our dataset for today. I created a playlist on Spotify, which is quite diverse, so we can look at a range of features. You can even listen to it if you want to, while you do the exercises. I am doing so as I wrote this piece. The cool thing about Spotify is that they have an API, an application interface. APIs are ways for computer programs to talk to each other. So while we use the Spotify app, computer programs use the API to talk to the Spotify server. And because R has a rich ecosystem of packages, someone already wrote a package that allows R to talk to this API. It is called Spotify R. And you can find the link in the script. You check out the R folder for this lecture, which is lecture six. You can find the script that I used to download the data and process it, so there are some less pitfalls in our data. Uh, note that the script will not work for you right away, because you first need to register with Spotify as a developer and then got a, get a so-called token. A token is like a username and a password in one long text to be allowed to send bots their way to download the data. For you, you probably just want to download the data from my GitHub repository the usual way, as we did in lecture one. Let's have a look at the data, shall we? So I usually start up by doing library tidyverse. If this is not working for you, it is probably because you're using Renv and you haven't installed the tidyverse locally to your project. And I will also be a bit more strict and make sure that this is at the top of my script <clears throat> because then I can see right away what I need. And now that I'm here, I can also load the tidy models package as well. Sometimes it can be, can be helpful to put, the, put those two in the setup chunk as well because then they will automatically be loaded every time I open up this. Okay. Now let's load our data and let's call it songs. And we can read it using read CSV. It's in the data folder. And there's only one file there, so I just use the auto completion. Let's have a look. This is the full data set. We can use the dplyr function glimpse to get a quick glimpse of our data. Ah, finally, some decent numbers not just these measly discrete values we had last week. So for each song in the playlist, we get the artist, the year it arrived, and a number of features like how danceable it is, how loud or fast the song is. You can easily imagine Spotify using these numbers to suggest new songs based on the features of those that you have listened to. And in fact, we are going to lay the foundations for such an algorithm today. But the first thing we are going to do is talking about these continuous distributions. When dealing with continuous distributions, like we have for features in the Spotify songs data set, there are always a number of ways to represent the same data. Now, first, you can just look at the numbers. We'll use the valence as an example. So these are the first couple of numbers. Do you notice anything interesting in these numbers? No, I, do, I don't either. Our brain is way better 
suited for looking at graphic graphical representations to notice patterns. So let's take the song data set and pipe it into ggplot. I will just um, use one axis today and I'll set the x-axis to something constant like a factor zero. And now I will put the valence on the y-axis. And now this is all our numbers, but it's kind of hard to see because the points overlap. We can get a better picture of the distribution by using transparency or a bit of jitter or maybe a bit of both. And I also realize in the script I used a different theme and I used it throughout the script. So let's do this up here as well. Using theme set, we can set a theme that will be used throughout the rest of the document. And I think I used theme light. This is looking better. So, first things first, we wanted to jitter the points, and maybe we don't want to jitter them too much. Let's use a width of 0 0.05. This already makes it easier to see the distribution of points. Another popular way to do this is to group these values into bins and then use a histogram. So let me copy this code. I do not need anything on the x-axis. This will just be the valence and the y-axis will be computed by geom histogram. This is one way to, to visualize our distribution. You might want to play around with the bin size, or in this case, the bin width a bit. For example, now our bin width is automatically computed from the data and it uses some approximation and some heuristic to, to, to estimate this. But maybe we want to try out different values. For example, point 0.1 gets us larger bins or point 0.01 should get us smaller bins. This is something to consider when using histograms. The default choice might not always be the one that re reveals the most about your data. Another way to go about this is to take a continuous function and smoothly put it over our data. So what I will do here is just copy and paste this code. Instead of using histogram, I use density. And this applies the smoothing. And what I sometimes like to do is because this is a density function, the area underneath the curve actually has a meaning. It's the integral, so the area underneath there will be the actual probabilities we get when we work th with this probability density function. So I like to color it in. Let's um, use dark blue and some transparency. And I think this looks rather nice. Keep in mind that both of these plots, the histogram and the density, can be a bit misleading if the original number of points is quite low. In most cases, we are better off showing the actual points as well. This is the reason why the first plots I did, I did vertically. Because there's a cool, cool way of showing both the points and the distribution while still having space to display different distributions next to each other. Let's do so now. So imagine taking the density plot and turning it 90 degrees and then mirroring it through the middle. Now we get what is so called a violin plot. Let's go ahead, copy and paste. We are lazy and now we use geom violin and uh, we need this dummy variable on our x axis again. The discrete dummy variable, this is why I use factor. I don't want it to, inter to inter interpret zero as something that can range between different values. And now we get the distribution. 
I can use the same properties that I used up here <coughs> for Geom Violin as well. And this enables me to also add the points to it. We could do so using Geom Jitter, but uh, for now I want something a bit more predictable. There's a pretty cool package called GGB Swarm. And you can install it using the methods already shown. And it has a number of geoms. One of these is geom quasi random, which creates some pretty nice looking plots. Let's also make the points a bit transparent in here. <clears throat> and now we have the distribution as well as the, the actual points and the way the actual points look like m represents the distribution as well, which I think is a really cool way to show it. And this enables us to put more things on the x-axis. For example, let's say we want to know, to know if do songs in the major chord have a higher valence than songs in the minor chord in our data set. So I may sh maybe should have explained this. But the valence in here, this is how happy or sad a song is perceived by the algorithm. So a higher valence means the algorithm thinks this is a very happy song. And a low valence means the algorithm thinks this is a very sad song. Um, so high valence, happy, and low valence is angry or sad. And the mode, let's convert this to a factor as well. We look at the songs. The mode can be either 0 or 1, and the 0 means the minor chords, and 1 means the major chords. So, for the German speaking people out there, is Moll and Dur. So, 0 will be minor and one will be major chords. So our expectation would be that, well, major chords should be more happy. But there's something weird going on here. Because we have this large clump of things that are down with a very low balance. There's one uh, note. The jittering in here only works because the features on the x-axis are discrete. If it were continuous values, we would be changing the data by jittering on the x-axis. So we wouldn't be really allowed to do this. You might also want to add, for example, the mean for each of these two distributions to the plot. And this leads us to the general concept of summary statistics. There's a number of them and they can be quite useful to, well, summarize complex distributions. But they can also be very misleading as can any simpli simplification be. Let us start by considering different things we can say about our distribution in one number. First, we might look at the range of our numbers, the maximum and the minimum. We will do so per mode, so it should be these values in here. And we will do so using our trusted dplyr. Take the songs, group by mode and then we summarize the maximum we just call max valence and the minimum we call we use min valence and now we get the highest and lowest value for each mode this is also called the range and there is a function for this called range. So, for example, the range of the full number of balance values is these two numbers, lowest and highest value. Next, we might want to know the centers of the points. There are different notions of what being at the center of a distribution means like. There is the mean, which is the average. So we take all the values, we add them together, and then divide by the number of values. And then there's the median, 
The median is what we call a quantile, a point that divides a distribution in equally sized parts. In the case of the median, it is the point such that 50% of values are below and 50% are above the median. If I just be lazy and copy and paste this, I can get the mean and the median in here for both things. And now it doesn't work because I should be better at copying and typing. And here we go. So the mean is about 0 0.4. So it should be right here, and a bit lower for the major mode. <clears throat> the median is just one of many percentiles we can't think of. If we display the 50s as well as the 75th percentile on one plot, we get what is called a box plot. Let me actually just be lazy and copy and paste the code from my script. And you can always look up the code in the script if you want to replicate this plot. So the middle line in each box is the median of the distribution. And then up here we have the 75th and the 25th percentile. The whiskers of the blot extend to 1.5 times the box size or at least the last data point, whichever makes smaller whiskers. Points that are more extreme than the whiskers are called outliers in this model and displayed as their own points. In the original data there were no outliers, so I had to cheat and just add a row with an outlier. Do not do this with your actual data, please. Again, uh, there's one drawback. Because the box is a very prominent feature of a box, the main focus point, but by definition it only contains 50% of all the data points. The rest is delegated to thin whiskers. So when I'm doing box plots and I do have the space and it's not, it's not, it's not, too, it's not adding too much complexity, I like to add the raw numbers as well. So if I take the songs and use ggplot using the mode on the x axis and on the y axis I'm using the valence, I can add the gm box plot. Not gm, gm, gm box plot. But I can also add, for example, a geom. A geom quasar random that I used earlier. And now it's plotted on top of each other. And in the script, I also made this colorful because I like color. In this case, I'm, I'm not doing it. Now, there's one thing to notice if you have outliers, they will of course be in this quasar random geom, but they will also be displayed in the box plot. So we, you will see them twice. Actually, if I Copy the row that adds the outlier. You can see this. It's um, actually plot plotted twice. We're just not seeing it because it's right on top of each other. So what you will want to do in this case um, is set outlier color to NA. But please only do so if you are actually plotting all the points, not just any time you're doing a box plot. Finally, we want to know how far the values scatter around their means and the potential population mean. This is encompassed by two closely related measures, the variance and the standard deviation. Let's jump over to the slides, because in here, what I did is I took all the values for the valence and just plotted them as points in the order they appear in the data, just to have any order. I also added a line for the mean and the distance to the mean shown by a red line. The variance is the expected value of the square deviation of a random variable from its mean. In other words, you take all the red lines, you add them up 
and divide by n minus 1. Hang on, I hear you say, why n minus 1? And it's an excellent question. The first statement up here talked about an expected value. So one example of an expected value is the mean, which is the expected value of, well, the value itself. And indeed, expected value often has this term divide by n, the number of samples. But the statement above was talking about the expected value of the squared deviation for the whole population. But we can only use this uncorrected version, which is dividing by n, when we have the whole population. For example, all songs that ever existed. And we want to talk about that population. But usually, all we have is a sample from which we want to draw conclusions about the population. But when we are using the sample to estimate the variance of the population, it will be biased. We can correct for this bias using n minus 1 instead of n. This is known as Bessel's correction, if you want to look it up again. I'm yet to come by a really intuitive explanation, but here's one idea. The thing we are dividing by, this n minus 1, is not necessarily the sample size any time we try to calculate the expected value of an estimator. It just happens to be the sample size in a bunch of cases. What the term really represents here is the number of degrees of freedom of the deviations. So the deviations are the red lines. And degrees of freedoms can be thought of as the number of independent things. You have probably come by it in physical chemistry. The, de the degrees of freedom are n reduced by 1 because if we know the mean and we use it in our calculations, this is the mean, so we must know it. Once we know all but one of the individual values, for example, this one, and we know the mean, we automatically know this last value. You can just calculate back from the formula for the mean. So one of our values is not allowed to count towards our degrees of freedom, so we must subtract one. Okay, quite a mouthful. Next up, we have the standard deviation or sigma, which is the square root of the variance, which is nice because it undoes this squaring here, so we are back in the dimensions of our data. This is why the square root is more often used in error bars than the variance, for example. Finally, we have the standard error of the mean, sometimes only called standard error, or SEM, or only SE. It is also very commonly used in error bars. The reason for a lot of people to favor it over the standard deviation might just be that it is smaller, because it's divided by the square root of the sample size. But they have distinct use cases. Let's go over how this comes together. Imagine this. We actually have the whole population available. Like, for example, all penguins on Earth. And we repeatedly take samples of size n. The means of these individual samples will vary. So they will have its own mean, standard deviation, and variance. The standard error is the standard deviation of these means. It is a measure of how far the means of re repeated samples get around the true population mean, for all penguins for example. However, we don't usually have the whole population. Measuring some property of all penguins in the world takes a long time, and running an experiment, experiment in the lab for all cells that exist and will ever exist takes an infinite amount of time. This is probably more than our research grant money can finance. So instead, the standard error of the mean in our formula uses the standard deviation of our sample instead of the standard deviation of the whole population, which we don't know. It is just our best guess. So we are using the standard deviation of our sample as the best guess for the standard deviation of the whole population. So when you're trying to make inferences about the mean of the whole population based on your sample, 
it makes sense to also give the standard error of the mean as a way of quantifying our uncertainty about this mean. While R has functions for SD, the standard deviation and the mean and the variance, whoops, it does not have a function for the standard error of the mean. However, we can easily create one ourselves. The standard error of the mean, SEM, is a function of x that computes the standard deviation of x and divides it by the length x, which is the sample size. And now we have this function, and I will actually use it in the next graph. This is an example of why I want you to be wary of simple bar graphs with error bars. There's a lot that can be misleading about that. Let's look at um, this one particularly horrible example. When people say the y-axis has to include zero, this is the reason for it. It is not always true when there's another sensible baseline that is not zero, but especially for bar plots, not having the y-axis start at zero is about the most misleading thing you can do. The main reason for this is that humans perceive the height of the bars via their area. So we are not really looking at these values here and seeing that it's actually just a tiny, tiny difference. Instead, we think, okay, this is a number of times bigger than this one, even though the difference is tiny. This plot also makes no indication of the type of error bars used. And it also does something which I, which I personally don't like, and this is for dynamite plots, instead of properly showing that the error bars go in both directions, positive and negative, it just puts them on top, makes it look like a dynamite, and you don't want your plots to explode. So you might want to choose a different color that makes sure you can see the error bars above and below your means. It also makes no indication of the number of samples in each group. And because it's just a bar plot, it hides the actual distribution behind our values. Let's look at it for a second. So I take the songs, type it into ggplot, and I want to have, for example, um, what I used in the plot earlier is the speechiness, how speechy the songs were. And I now color them by factor of the mode and also fill it by, by the node. And now I'll use geom density to show the distributions. And I will also make it a bit transparent so we can see when they are overlapping. And now we see these are pretty wild distributions. It would be a disservice to the distribution to just summarize them in just one mean for each group. So the next time you see a bar plot, ask the question, are your summary statistics hiding something interesting? I hope you can take some inspiration from this chapter and now have the vocabulary to know where to look when it comes to your own data. I had a lot of fun making the graphs for today's session. Naturally, there will be a couple of questions as to how they were done. There's two pointers I want to give you. The first being the ggplot book. All things ggplot. The third edition of the ggplot book is currently being worked on by three absolute legends of their craft. Edley Wickham is the author of the original ggplot and ggplot 2. Danielle Navarro makes amazing artwork with and teaches ggplot. And Thomas Lynn Peterson is the current maintainer of ggplot and constantly makes really cool features for it. The under development version of the book. Is already available online and when it's released you can also buy a paper version of it. Secondly we need to briefly talk about a concept we have only brushed by. It is graphics devices. Graphics devices are to R what a printer is to your computer. When you create a plot in R it starts out as mere numbers. Something has to turn these numbers into pixels. In the case of raster images or vectors in the case of vector images. 
You might know SVG for Scalable Vector Graphics or PEF files. Sorry, but these are not the vectors in R, but rather descriptions of lines that then describe your plot. This is the job of the graphics device. When we use the ggsafe function, for example, it figures out what to use based on the file extension, but we can also specify it manually. I'm mentioning this here, because in the plot I just showed you, I used a different font than the default. Uh, this is something that can be incredibly tricky for graphic, graphic devices, for, because fonts are handled differently on every operating system. Luckily, it is about to get way easier, because Thomas Lynn Peterson is actually working on an another package, which is a graphics device that is both really fast and works well with fonts. This is where you can check out the current development version. Link is in the script. And I use this because it enables me to really easily use system fonts. There are many distributions out there. Luckily, one of them is quite special and can be used in a multitude of settings. It is the harmlessly named normal distribution. R has the usual functions for it, like density, probability, quantile, and random. So D, P, Q, and R. Norm for normal. For example, we can get a bunch of normally distributed values using R norm. And I quite often use this to test things. Let's look at how the distribution density function looks like. And this time again, I am copy and pasting some code. If you care about the details of the code and want to have a look at it again, please refer to the script or just pause the video at this point. And I will also explain what the different new geoms in here do. So first, we have the geom function which allows us to supply a function that then gets passed the values on the x-axis to compute the y-axis. And there's also a stat function, which just does the same thing, but we can choose a different geometric object to represent these. So the default for geom function is just a line, but I also wanted to add the fill and make it Make it clear that this is a distribution density function for the probability. So the actual probability will be the integral, the area underneath this curve, which is represented by this cumulative distribution, uh, cumulative probability function, p norm. You have seen this curve as the standard bell curve. So why is this distribution so special? The central limit theorem or in short, CLT, states that the sample mean of a sufficiently large number of independent random variables is approximately normally distributed. The larger the sample, the better the approximation. For a great visualization of the central limit theorem, there's a link in the script by a project called Seeing Theory. This is especially interesting because a lot of values we measure are actually the sum of many random processes. And this is why distributions of things we measure can often be approximated with a normal distribution. We can visualize if some values follow the normal distribution using a so called quantile quantile plot, which qu plots the quantiles of our sample against where the quantiles should be on the normal distribution. A straight line means perfectly normal. Let's for example use the valence. But of course I have the valence in the tibble, not just as a normal vector. So let's use the songs and look at only one mode, for example, the major chord. And then pull out the valence. And now I can use QQ norm using valence and also QQ line, which adds where the values should be. 
The values close to the mean are pretty normal, but the tails of the distribution stray further from the normal distribution. They are way more small and very large numbers than we would expect from a normal distribution. There's one thing that comes up a lot in biological data, because a lot of processes in biology are reliant on signal cascades. They tend to be the result of many multiplicative effects rather than additive independent variables as would be required for the central limit theorem. As a result, they are not distributed normally. But, because taking the logarithm of values transforms multiplicative effects into additive effects, they are often distributed log normally. So you take the logarithm of all your values, and then they are often approximately normally distributed. However, the central limit theorem is only valid for large sample sizes. For smaller sample sizes, the distribution of means has fatter tails than a normal distribution. This is why for most statistical tests, we use the T distribution instead of the normal distribution. This here is the normal distribution in orange and T distributions with different degrees of freedoms. S the degrees of freedom, so basically the sample sizes, approaches infinity, it gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. However, for smaller sample sizes, it is way more honest. All right, do you remember the plot we did about the, about the valence for different modes, minor and major? And I said, well, Maybe happier songs with higher valence are also um, tend to be in major chord. So let's formally test this hypothesis. And for this, we use the t distribution, and what we use is student's t test. Student was just the pseudonym of its inventor. And the T stands for T distribution. And I don't actually know what the T and T distribution stands for. So let me know. Let me know in the comments if you know. We can use it to test the null hypothesis that two samples come from the same distribution when they are approximately normally distributed. Let's put the distribution up here again. I think this makes it easier to see. And what we use in R is the t dot test, and then we write we want the valence dependent on the mode. And for the data, we use the songs. And now we get this two, two sample t test because we're comparing two samples. We get the means for the two groups, and those groups will be the different levels of the factor we have in mode. And we get a p-value. And this is a p-value for the probability to get a difference in means as extreme or more extreme as observed in our samples. Here, the p-value is very small, not because the difference is very large, but because we have a lot of data to back up this small difference. Tests that rely on the assumption of normality are called parametric. But what if we can't fulfill this assumption? Then we need a non-parametric test that doesn't rely on this assumption of normality. The Wilcoxon rank sum test or Men Whitney U test is one of these. It gets around this assumption of normality by transforming the data into ranks first. This means all points are just ordered by their value, and then their values are replaced by their position in the ordering, which is their rank. If we think of the t-test as testing for a difference in means, we can think of the Wilcoxon rank sum test 
as testing for a difference in medians. For example, let us use the Wilcoxon Ransom test on something which is definitely not normally distributed because I checked earlier. We use Wilcox.test and we use the speechiness. The speechiness dependent on the mode. And as the data, we use the songs. And this gives us a Wilcoxon test. And we also get a p value. If you apply a usual cutoff, we would reject the null hypothesis and say there is a difference. A couple of things about these tests. One is about the direction of testing. The two tests, both of them, I look at the help page, have this argument called alternative, which can be two sided, greater, or less. This is the direction of our alternative hypothesis. Are we testing for x being greater or less than y? Or are we testing for a difference in any direction? Having a hypothesis about the direction beforehand will result in smaller p-values, exactly half of the two-side p-values. But you need to have this hypothesis before looking at the data. And especially not after running the two-sided two test. So you can't run the two-sided test and then decide that you want a smaller p-value and also decide that you had this hypothesis of, for example, speechiness being higher for major chords all along. If you are not sure about the direction and which is supposed to be greater, for example, major and minor mode, because there, it depends on the order of the levels in this mode factor, we can supply the values in a different way. Instead of giving it this formula interface, we can also give it x and y. So let's get the different vectors out as raw vectors. The speechiness for the for the minor chord. For the minor mode, it's all the songs. Whoops. All the songs filtered for mode being equal to zero, and then we pull out the speechiness. I copy this line so that I can get the same thing for the major mode. And then I'm lazy, so I use minor as the first argument and major as the second argument. And we can run this. Now the direction is clear um, because in here it says character specifying the hypothesis. So it will be x rather than two side by default. But when we say, for example, alternative. Greater, it's for the hypothesis that minor mode has a greater speechiness. If we say lesser, oh no, just less, we get a really, really large p value because the effect was exactly the opposite of what our hypothesis was. If we take any of these two tests and store it in a variable, we can use this variable to explore the test further. For example, internally it is just a list from which we can get, for example, the p value if we want to use this further. For confidence interval, I'm actually going back to the t test because the t test can also be used to compute so-called confidence interval. We use t dot test on a lonely sample, for example, so we only have one group. Let's use 
the valence only for the minor chord in here and just run a t-test on it. I'm calling it test again. It's a one sample t-test. <coughs> it tells us the estimated mean. It also gives us this 95% confidence interval. It is the range in which we would expect the mean of a sample to fall in 95% of cases when we repeat an experiment an infinite amount of times. These confidence intervals are also sometimes used as error bars in plots. We can get one out, for example, using confint. So the first, first element of this will be the lower one. Second element of this will be the upper confidence interval, uh, the upper confidence limit. Lastly, for today, we are going a bit out of scope. We are leaving the realms of looking at individual features and trying to condense all this information into as little space as possible. We are crunching dimensions, dimensionality reduction, and we are using DCA, which is Principal Component Analysis. The general notion of dimensionality reduction is to take all the features that we have like speechiness, acousticness, sentimentalness, and so forth, and to find a representation of those that present those best without losing too much information. For example, when two features are highly correlated, which means one changes when the other does, like for example, Let's take the loudness and the energy. And plot them using points. And let me swap this so it looks like I had in the script, which is energy and loudness, the other way around. We might as well just replace them with a single value that represents how far the value is along this line here. Because these values are so highly correlated. The loudness gets louder and the energy gets higher, for example. We don't necessarily need, need those features. What we want is this axis that goes through here and that explains most of the variance in the data. And the rest can be accounted for by the per perpendicular axis that is perpendicular to this line. And this is notably less important than the main line which goes through and explains most of the variance. Let's take this to another level. Imagine you are a whale shark. And you see this swarm of grill. So what you want to do is orientate your mouth, orientate your mouth in such a way that you can eat the greatest amount of shrimp possible. So what you will naturally do is find the axis which explains the most variation in the location of the grill. So this is very similar to what happened here. And this is the first principal component. The second principal component is perpendicular to the first one. This is quite a throwback to math for natural scientists, which you might have, and linear algebra. We are defining a new coordinate system here in terms of the old one. So, but whale sharks swim in three dimensions, not just two. Our data has even more. You can think of each feature as representing one dimension. So, if you are able to think of our data in terms of this n dimensional thing, let's try to imagine being an n dimensional whale shark. And now we want to find this first principal component. 
which gets us the most quill in one sweep. And this can be quite hard for humans to do, but luckily the Tidy Models framework has us covered. So if you haven't already, in the top, you want to run library tidy models now. But I already did this at start. Principal component and analysis itself is not a model, but is rather a data pre-processing step that generates new features, the principal components, which we can later use for other models. Uh, but today we will do just the pre-processing by itself and not do any actual modeling in this sense. In tidy models, pre-processing steps are defined in a recipe using the recipe package. So let's create a songs recipe using receipt or recipe, the recept recipe function in here. We first define this formula. However, there's nothing on the left side of this formula. It is just this weird syntax of something dependent on dot and dot will be every feature we have in our data. And the data is the song state. Not having anything on the left side here means we do not have an outcome variable, something our model would try to predict from the features that we give it. We just use everything as features. Well, not everything. I can update the role of certain features. For example, I want the track name. The track name and the track artists. I have the new role ID. So they will identify each row instead of being features that are used for the learning process. There's another step we want to do, and this is a step normalize. And we can choose using a couple of helper functions. For example, we can say we want all predictors. These are a bit like the select helpers in dplyr. So these would be all features that are not used for IDs. Or if we had this supervised way where we had like a target outcome, this wouldn't be in the predictors. And next we want a step PCA for principal component analysis. And we want to choose the variables to use in the principal components. And again, we want all predictors. Similar to all predictors, there's also all outcome variables, but we don't have any outcome variables in here. Now it says us that uh, track artists does not exist. This is because I need to get better at typing. And it's Plural. Okay, here we go. Now what we have is now what we have is this songs recipe. There's a summary of what's happening, centering and scaling for our predictors, and there are currently no PCA components expected. This is because we need to take this recipe now and repair it. So what we do is we prep the songs recipe and let's save it to a variable called songs prep. This is what you normally call it. We've got recipe rec and the prepared recipe prep. And now it did centering and scaling and it trained on the data we gave it. And it also extracted principal components for these features, which are all our predictors. We can get a tidy representation of these steps using the function tidy. So what we do is we take our prepared recipe and now we can either give it an ID of the step, but we didn't, didn't give it an ID. We can also give it the number of step and we know the second step 
The second step up here is in the PCA. So I use two. So I use two in here. And this is the tidy representation of what happened to our data during this or after this step. Let's save this to a variable. I call it songs components. Just so we can look at it again. Let's write it down here. So the original features like danceability and energy and key and loudness can now be replaced by principal components. Actually, a number of them, 15 in total. We could have chosen how many we wanted to use up here in step PCA, but you will later see we will actually only use the first two or three. For sake of brevity, I'm going to copy and paste the code for the next plot from the script, but I will explain it now. So first, let's talk about what we're seeing in this plot. Each principal component is a linear combination of original features. Just like we had earlier in this simple plot, this line can be described as a linear combination of those two features. So you can go back and forth between those two representations. And this plot shows you what features make up the first, second, and third principal component. I could have plotted more, but I chose to go with only three. So the first principal component is made up of these features. And a high number on the principal component one means the song has a high acousticness and a high instrumentalness and a low energy and loudness. In order to get these plots to order the way they do now, I used a trick because the tidy text package has this function reorder within, which is nice for reordering columns within facets, which is normally quite tricky. So there's tidy text reorder within and tidy text scale y reordered. These two need to be used in combination to get these nicely ordered plots which is really, really nice for PCA plots. We can not only look at what features make up the components, but also how our data looks like in the new principal component space. So in terms of this simple representation, this would mean just taking this whole plot and turning it so that this line here becomes the new x-axis and the perpendicular line becomes the new y-axis except we're doing this in a bunch of dimensions, one dimension being one feature. So in order to get our data, which is being prepared with these pre-processing steps, we need to bake the recipe. So we take the prepared recipe and use the function bake using some prep. And now, because this workflow can be used for really advanced machine learning as well, and then you often have a training data set that you use for training, and then a testing data set that you hold out for later, um, this can take this new data, which means you will train your pre-processing on your training data, and then you apply the same steps to your testing data as well. In this case, we don't have any testing data. We are using all our data just right away, which you wouldn't do for, for example, for machine learning. We're just exploring things here. So we set new data to null, which means it will just use the data that was used to calculate these components that was used in our preparation. So we're just getting the data back out, except now it will be transformed in these principal component base. So let's call it songs baked. And now we have it in a variable. And these features are now replaced with their principal components. So we can use these to blot them again. So let's take the baked songs. 
And what I also want to do is I later want to um, want to show some labels. And I want these labels to have the track name and also the artist. So let's just call it song. And this is going to be paste of the track name. Then a uh, comma. And then the track artist. And now we can work with these songs as labels. I'm using ggplot. On the x-axis I'm using principal component 1 and then pc2 on the y-axis. And as a label I'm using the song. Oh, and I forgot. For this needs to go in the IES function for aesthetics. I'm also adding a geom h line where we have zero, so the y intercept went to zero. And let's make it a bit transparent. Let me copy this line to also get a vertical line which has an x intercept, not a y, y intercept. And now I'm finally adding a geom point. Now you might wonder why I'm doing this because geom point has no labels. It's kind of sad because we, now we can't see the songs. I'm using this because now I save this to a new variable and I use the plotly package, the ggplotly, to take this plot and display it. And ggplotly will just display these labels when we hover over these songs. So, in order to better understand this, let's take the plot that we had up here and just pop it out. Let's put it down, down here so we can see both at the same time. I think this makes it easier to interpret our plot. So, now we have our songs in our principal component base. So we did some fancy linear algebra here, except we didn't have to do it harder, which is kind of nice. And what we see, for example, principal component one, higher up on here means high acousticness, instrumentalness. And on here we see all these classical ones, for example, by Dvorak. Very acoustic, of course. Um, there's also some film music, for example, John Williams is in here. More Dvorak. And on the other side, we have high energy and loudness, very loud songs. Um, La Familia from the Spider Man to the Spider Verse soundtrack. And we'll Take On Me from Aha. Reckless Paradise by Billy Talent, of course, very loud and high, of high energy. The balance also is a bit more angry than happy. Yeah. On the second axis, High on the PC2 means it's high tempo, which is, we will never forget, by William Porter, seems to be very, very fast. Uh, Rise Against, always very fast songs. Again, more Rise Against. Through Fire and Flames by Dragonforce, also very fast song. Um, but down here we should have slower songs like, okay, Toto Africa, um, this is a slow song. Wake Me Up Before You Go goes, apparently on this axis as well. And this shows us, um, I mean, it's Pretty fast, I think, um, but uh, maybe it is um, um, because this principal component is made up of more than just the tempo. That's more contributors. This is maybe why it ended up down here. Pretty cool to explore these songs like this. Um, lastly, I want to stress that all these principal components, like one, two, three, four, are not created equal. The first principal component will always be the most important because it explains the most of the variance. We can have a look at how much of the variance in our original data, our original features, it explains using a different, different kind of plot. For this, we need to explicitly look into this prepped recipe. Uh, let's look at these steps. 
And I want only the second step, which is the principal component analysis. And we can further go down here. We want the results. And the results also have this standard deviation, which is how much of the standard deviation was explained by this component. And we can pre uh, process this a bit more. Let's call it SDEF. This is how much of the variation in the data was explained by the by first, second, third, and so forth component. We can turn this into um, a typically used representation, which is how much of the total variation in percent did it explain. Let's call it percent variation. We get this by using the SDEF, rarring it, and then dividing by the sum of SDEF, so the total variation. And now we can use this and we can, let's pack it up in a table, the component is going to be well, all these, how many of these? 15. Um, Let's uh, use the paste function here. And I'm using paste. Oh, let's use paste. You see? And the number from 1 to 15. And then the percent variation. Let's call it percent var. Now we have this in a neat table format. Uh, we can also, I think they should already be ordered, just, but just let's make sure that our components are ordered. So the component is going to be FCT in order, which tells it, okay, it's already ordered, just make sure this order is encoded in the vector. And then we use ggplot. And on the x-axis, we put the component. On the y-axis, we put the percent variation, which we call percent var. And use geom call. And there we go. Um, in this case, the first principal component explained a bit more than 40% of the total variation. And the second principal component is way, way less important. So keep this in mind when you interpret these plots, for example. If you ever get to do principal component analysis, I think it's great fun. So um, I hope you do at some point. Now let's talk a little bit about the exercises. The Tidy Tuesday project also had a Spotify dataset. And this one is even more interesting because it ranges across different playlists of various genres. And it is annotated with that genres. It has over 30,000 songs. And you can also see a data dictionary, which, which tells you more about what these features actually, actually represent. So go ahead and explore this. In the first exercise, which I called the Plotty Horror Picture Show, I ask you to make a truly horrible plot. And then in the second exercise, you are asked to take a sad plot and make it better and take what you learned about horrible plots to make a good plot. And then I'm not including any specific exercises on the statistics we have today, but I ask you to think about all the questions that come up. Maybe already write them down in your uh, markdown document that you will hand in. And then we can talk about those on Friday. And I'll see you next time.